Okay, I'd like to call the meeting back to order. Um, and uh, first uh, item on the agenda is a uh, president's report, and I just want to uh, take the opportunity to wish all of our students and our our parents, our faculty, our, our administration and staff a very um, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and another and a healthy and uh, happy New Year next year. And I would also like to thank my fellow board members for all their dedication to helping make this um, and continue to make this uh, one of the most outstanding schools in the United States. Uh, so with that, uh, I will turn it over to Roy. You have a few for the brief. Minutes, I'm sorry? Oh, oh, we have the minutes. We have to approve the minutes from the last meeting. I think it was November 16th. Do I have a mo we have a motion. Do I have second. a second? Motion and a second. Do I have any changes, corrections, comments on the minutes? No. Uh, all in favor of the motion? Any opposed? Okay, thank you very much. That motion passes. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. I also want to uh, extend my best wishes for great holiday times and happy holidays to all, and best wishes for an amazing 2018 that we have to look forward to ahead. So, um, it's a busy time in our school. We've had holiday sings and winter concerts, and there's another one tomorrow evening for the high school orchestra uh, and choral concert. So we're looking forward to uh, seeing that. Um, but it's a really, truly a, a magical time in our schools right now, and I want to uh, thank everybody for their participation and, and the good work that, that, are going, that is going on for us. Um, I'm going to get right into uh, item C at the moment and uh, invite Dr. Ketke up to uh, provide. Oh, I, I wanted to. Oh, you want to do that oh. first? I didn't know what you wanted. Oh, you're going to do that before facility? Uh, yeah, I thought so. Get the kids here, but you can do this first if you want. Um, what you, what how long is that? Okay, we have facilities on the agenda gonna, first, so on, I, I think this will. Uh, I think this will be first. short. Never mind. Right. <laughs> no, no, we, sorry. Thank, sorry. thank you very much. Switching. Sorry. Yeah, we want to do a talk uh, just a little bit about the capital plan project update. So I'm just going to make a couple of comments about our uh, you know, proposed referendum that uh, people know is out there, and uh, and I believe there's a lot of confusion about it. And I want to start off by saying um, an introduction. Our board. Um, has a tough job. We have to balance the priorities of our three constituencies, uh, which are, of course, our students, our faculty, administration, and staff, and, uh, and, the, and our village residents, our taxpayers. Uh, most important, of course, the obligation is to our students and the education of our students, and uh, we have to ensure that this is an environment where our students can excel and are prepared for the future. Our facilities are very important to creating, to helping create that environment. You know, this is no easy task. Uh, I've read where experts say that 65% of our elementary school students will have jobs that don't exist today. Uh, we can't, cannot sit still and pretend that we can teach the same way we've done in the past, and we haven't done that. We've uh, made great innovations in, in teaching in our school. And, uh, for example, for all of us that spend all that time memorizing things, kids now can... Uh, have, they have Siri and Google at their fingertips, you know. So it's a, it's a new world uh, for teaching, and collaborating and an innovation space that uh, we need to uh, be competitive with other schools uh, around us. Another important constituency of course is our faculty and staff and administration. These are our professional educators. These are the ones teaching our kids. They're developing the forward-looking strategy and curriculum and um, preparing our kids for the future. And the point I want to make, our third constituency is, of course, our taxpayers, our residents. And we know that the taxpayers, as we and the board, we're all taxpayers, we all want to pay the lowest possible taxes and have the highest possible real estate values. We all know there is a direct correlation of real estate values and the quality of our school. We all remember why we moved here. And nothing will reduce the real estate values faster than letting the quality of the school decline. From a tax standpoint, over the last six years, from a keeping taxes low point of view, our average increase has, has been around 1% a year in tax levy from the school. Um, in addition, now with the Kensington uh, condo projects, I, I think we are expecting that the tax levy for individual uh, residents will decrease by about 1% 
we'll get more revenues from them, but we don't get those revenues. They reassess and uh, revalue all the properties based upon that. So our tax levy will actually decrease by 1% because of that and, and net it in whatever else we do. Uh, this leads me to our plan referendum. And I know, as I said, there's been confusion about this. Our last big referendum was $30 million in around 1995 or 1996, and that was for the C Wing. Since then, we've done a $2 million referendum after the flood in 2007. We did the um, $835,000 referendum for the flood mitigation project. And we did a $4 million re bond referendum for the auditorium, and we all know how that turned out. Thankfully, we have foundation and PTA. We have unbelievable commitments from an uh, unbelievable community here to help us. Uh, foundation assisted, and along with private uh, donors, to help us uh, with our fabulous auditorium. And uh, PTA, for example, is paying for the renovation of our uh, library uh, project. And, and both also uh, foundation gives grants to help us uh, 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 enhance the quality of the school from year to year, and the PTA supports us in so many ways. Um, from a Hayes Field standpoint, for those of you I didn't mention that, we paid for that out of our own funds. So, um, uh, so we have had very few referendums. Essentially, the, if you take away the flood, and we know what happened with the um, auditorium, how that came out, we've had basically haven't had a referendum since 1995. For as long as I've been on the board, and this is my sixth year on the board, we have been strategically thinking about the year 2021 for a new referendum. And the reason for that is that the C-Wing bonds, that debt service is fully amortized and comes off the books in 2020. So our thought was if we can wait and delay a lot of these projects and group it into a bond referendum for 2021, uh, there would be no increase in taxes. So we have been talking about a tax neutral bond referendum for a long time. Now, we're not oblivious to what's going on in Washington and that uh, it's going to have an impact on the state, um, but we still think that, um, you know, this is the right thing to do for us and the right time to do it. We really can't wait. Um, we, are so, we are long overdue in, in addressing the required maintenance and improvement in our 100-year-old building. I mean, we have crumbling masonry. Uh, roof and ceiling repairs. I'd like that the students could get up and, and reel this stuff off better than any of us. Um, that should not be deferred any longer. We have rusted out pipes in the restrooms. We have, um, as I said, um, roof repairs that need to be fixed. We do have a health office that was forced into a small area after a flood, which is now anything but healthy. Um, uh, we get ten, something like 10,000, what do we say, visits? 9,000 9, visits a year, and people are sitting on top of each other. Sick people are sitting on top of each other. Uh, we, we, um, we have a new program to, a new vision for our guidance center, and we're having a study to try to improve the guidance center. That also was pushed into a small area after a flood, but it's, um, frankly, it's, suboptimal, almost embarrassing compared to some of our competitor schools uh, for our students and the college admission directors that uh, visit us. Uh, we have kids that eat at all kinds of times and in all kinds of rooms around the school because they don't have the cafeterias necessary. And uh, the kids, our kids don't have uh, areas to collaborate. So when our high school students need to collaborate and break out into special project rooms, which we have always do when we go to conferences and things, they wind up doing it in hallways. We need, to do, we need to redo Chambers Field. We've had pe other teams balking at even playing on it, so it's overextended its use, so we need to do that as soon as possible with a more environmentally friendly field. That's, and uh, we need, obviously, a new, new playground for our, uh, for our young children. If we, are able to, uh, if we are able to withstand the flooding we've had in the past, we need three more, three additional pumps, and those cost a lot of money. So there are a number of things in here. And like I said, this is, there is no way for us to be able to pay for these things and to maintain this building, 100-year-old building, with operations, and particularly with a 2% cap when we've had increases of about 1% a year. 
So doing nothing is not an option. A lot of people have said, what will this cost if we don't do anything? Well, I can tell you, it's first of all, it's tax neutral, and that could be an increase, but if we didn't do anything, which is not, again, I can't imagine that that's an option, it would be about $463 on a, a million dollar assessment, which is about 3.5% of school taxes, or probably about 2.3% roughly back of the envelope on full taxes for a million dollar assessment. Um, again, as I said, we're not oblivious to what's going on in Washington. This is, by the way, again, if I repeat, it will be in effect in 2021, uh, not now. And, uh, and I do know that none of us are really sure what the impact of this new law will be, but uh, most of us, as we said in the past, unfortunately, we felt like we were subject to alternative minimum tax. I know everyone will be talking to their tax advisors about this. But it turns out for most people the effect isn't as great as what we would think if you just um, took your you know, state and local income taxes and, and property taxes and said they're no longer deductible, to the, to, except for the extent of $10,000. So um, it, this, is, this, is gonna, this is very important to the board. We, we, we're taxpayers too. We don't want to pay any more taxes than we have to pay. We've been elected into this role. We um, feel the same way everyone else does, but I do think the board has a very clear view of what really needs to be done. Uh, we need to continue um, to maintain our standing as one of the uh, best schools in the United States. And, um, and so with that, uh, you know, we're gonna move forward. We're gonna continue to communicate more about this. It's not, um, you know we haven't uh, we haven't finalized everything to the to the dollar yet on everything, but we will continue to do that and be communicating with you. But I wanted to at least provide some clarity, if I could, some very high level clarity, if I could, because there are a lot of questions going on about whether we are just oh oh we just have an opportunity now to do a tax neutral bond, so let's just throw a bunch of stuff in there and you know and and you know, put a swimming pool in the back. It's, uh, these are things we've delayed. As I said, we've been delaying these projects for a, for a very, very long time and it's very necessary that, that, we, uh, that we do this because there's no other way that we're gonna be able to do it unless we, if we had to do it through operations, we'd have to you know, vote for to go over the cap, which I'm sure no one would vote for, and then it would require cutting people, cutting headcount, uh, which is our faculty. And so to do that, you're talking about uh, a severe degradation of the quality of the school at that point. So um, that's what we're dealing with uh, as a board. And again, the um, board is very appreciative of, uh, of everybody's thoughts and input on this uh, as we go through this. But I wanted to, to at least provide that overview. Great. Do we have any, any other comments from anybody? On Did we have any other? Um, Presentations on this or no? No, no so other presentations on this. I just want to later emphasize we're do the, um, the other. Yeah, the other part. That we have a couple of resolutions related to the bond you, you get on uh, later on in the agenda, but I just want to emphasize again uh, to Jeff's point. Um, we, we look forward to communicating a lot more information after the holiday break. Uh, we'll be scheduling another meeting with our community advisory committee very shortly after the break uh, to review the projects, the impacts, um, and, and and tighten everything up once again. Uh, so you, you can look forward to a lot more information after we come back in January. Again, uh, you know, if I, I'll give you one more number for those. It, in 2021, it'll be about a net effect of 1.4 million. Again, it'll be neutral, but if we didn't do anything, it would be 1.4 million less on probably at that time around a $50 million budget. So we're talking 3.3 point something and change uh, in, in total for the budget at that time. So, Mara, I'm sorry I jumped so ahead of you. It, but It's a great transition into why we like coming to work every day and, and why we feel we're one of the top districts around. Uh, and Mara's going to talk to us a little bit about some of the curriculum work that, that has been going on because we really haven't had much uh, in the way of curriculum presentations. Uh, but I, it obviously it's very, very important to, uh, to what we do and how we do our work. And uh, Mara will kick us off. I know she has some students who are going to come up and present some uh, really exciting information and, and stuff that they've been working on. I do. Thank you. Um, 
So it's my pleasure tonight to talk about one of the dispositions of our Bronxville Promise innovation and some of the curriculum work that we have been doing around that area. Um, tonight we will be talking about work that is in process. Um, so these are not fully formed uh, <coughs> pieces of curriculum and or student products. Uh, but we will be hearing from some of our students tonight as they begin to think about um, engaging in the process of innovation and hopefully if time permits we can hear from them again in the spring to see how some of this work ended up. Uh, this is a quote from Sir Ken Robinson, creativity is the process of having original ideas that have value. It's a process, it's not random. We have as a faculty organized about 20 educators across the district K-12, immersed ourselves in some study about what uh, what does it mean to be innovative? What are the skills necessary? And we strongly believe that we can teach kids a process for being innovative, that this is not you know, reserved for um, the random geniuses and outliers of the world, but this is actually a process that can be taught and students can go through to increase their capacity and the ability to innovate. Just to speak a little bit about our curriculum process, we began in the summer, um, in June and August, to uh, define what it means. And again, this was done through a lot of um, you know, conversations about literature around innovation and, and its importance. Um, based on our definition and the skills that we felt students needed to have and practice to be innovative, we engaged in curriculum design. Uh, and assessment design. And we actually just had the consultant who's helping us with this back last week to meet with the teachers one-on-one -on -one as well as meet with me to give some feedback on their curricular designs in this area. Um, we will begin to pilot that work now and throughout the spring and give students feedback as to helping them grow as innovators and strengthening their work. And then in June, we get back together and we show all the student work across the district that aligns with innovation. And then we look at the student work to see if it evidences the outcomes um, that, and skills that we had originally defined. And if not, we redesign curriculum and or redesign our uh, definition. So some of the work that has come out of this and will be implemented uh, this spring with students is in our elementary school. We have uh, several classes who are going to work to redesign some aspect of classroom life that is identified as problematic. And this makes sense because the classroom hits very, very close to home for our youngest students and they are very engaged and excited in these activities. We also have an activity piece of curriculum for my to learn where fifth graders build and code a friendly monster. But in addition to that, they're really going to think of possible purposes for coding a friendly monster. Um, for example, it lights up, so maybe that's something, a pillow someone needs, wants to keep near their bed to find their glasses at night. <laughs> and really interview uh, who they're creating this for and think about their needs and how they might create it so that it's usable and interesting for the user. In middle school, students are identifying a need and designing a prototype using the components of Raspberry Pi, which is a miniature computer. Uh, and in high school, students are researching to find a community problem that can be solved using data or an app and focusing on an empathy and a felt need of the user uh, in order to create that design. We will actually hear tonight from two students enrolled in that class. As part of this process, we have sent teams uh, to the Harvard Conference on Design Thinking. Um, this was actually a grant originated by Jennifer Forsberg and paid for by the foundation. And here, they really talked specifically about the design thinking process, empathizing with your user, understanding their needs, defining their needs, you know, brainstorming potential solutions, prototyping tests, and continually revising. It was very interesting for us, as Jeff said, you know, 
65% of our students will probably uh, participate in jobs that have yet to be created. There were whole teams of people there from industries learning how to rethink how they do things. Um, my favorite piece was a group of uh, insurance salesmen <laughs> who now are realizing that you can actually go on an app if you happen to be uh, diving with sharks and insure yourself for a million bucks for the afternoon. So the term insurance policy may not be the best way of offering products uh, to their constituents. And it just made us, I think, really think about how our students are going to have to be able to think on their feet to redesign markets that are continually changing due to access to technology. Um, and this language is very sophisticated for some, so in our group we actually sought to revise that for our youngest students, so ask, imagine, create, and improve is how this language and process is being rolled out and understood and taught to our youngest of children. So I love to uh, have two students who are participating in the app design class, Matt Crawford and Andrew Cargill, come, come up and talk to us a little bit about what they're learning now and what they anticipate doing in the spring. Um, good evening. My name is Matt Crawford, and this is Andrew Cargill. I'm a uh, senior here at Bronxville High School, and I am uh, part of the app design pilot class. So I'd like to start off by saying um, I've actually attempted to quit or drop this class twice um, <laughs> this year. It is, it's pretty hard because it's like, uh, you guys probably all took languages in high school, it's like taking... Latin for when you have absolutely no experience. I had no experience with computer science, programming, coding, anything like that. After saying that, Mr. Ashley has convinced me time and time again to stick with it. Um, and I really appreciate that from him, but he's also just uh, given me countless amounts of resources, um, both on the web and in hand to enhance my learning and enable me to take this class. Now, just to speak a little bit up about this class, um, basically every day we, we sit at a circular table, um, we code uh, either half an app or a full app each day, working by um, ourselves. But like it's, it's similar to a startup, and Andrew will speak to this, because say one of us has a problem, we just nudge the guy next to us or the girl next to us, and we just say, hey, how can you help us? And this is something Mr. Ashley is really looking to do in this class, is make it similar to a startup, so I think that's extremely innovative and will help us in the future. Um, and then also just speaking about the class. Uh, so currently, we're learning the language of Swift, um, how to code, how to build very, very simple apps. And um, when we get back from break, we'll be identifying a problem, hopefully working with the Chamber of Commerce in Bronxville, identifying a problem with them, and uh, building an app to help them in some way, shape, or form. So thank you, and now this is Andrew. Uh, hello, my name is Andrew Cargill. It's nice to be here tonight. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit on the atmosphere and the startup feel of the class because this summer I interned at a startup um, in which we were creating like a medical sensor along with an app. And I think that the, the collaborative effort and the innovation we have with one another as classmates in this class particularly is unlike any other classroom where you know, traditionally you have a teacher up top, maybe you have a PowerPoint behind them speaking to us and giving us a lesson, whereas this class is almost flipped on its head where we're diving straight into it and it's up to us to work with each other and work with those online who are doing the same things as us to overcome any obstacles we have, to answer any questions we may have, and to really, it really enables us to not only mimic the startup feel and atmosphere, but to collaborate and innovate to get back to the Bronxville Promise in, unlike, in a way that is undone in any other class. Yeah, and actually, as someone who has previous um, experience with coding, unlike Mac, even not being a beginner, the class enables someone like myself or other classmates who have experience to be continually challenged as it's not a set end goal, 
so we are able to continually push the boundaries and that enables us, no matter your level of expertise, to keep learning and keep pushing the boundaries in the classroom. Thank you. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, okay, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any questions for these two gentlemen before we uh, move on in the presentation? Some time looking. Yeah, I, there, we are looking with the Chamber of Commerce, but just one I thought of um, for moms in Bronxville actually. Say there was like a more less sketchy app than Craigslist to find babysitters, and you could rate your own babysitters by accessing data from like a cloud. It would be, it'd be pretty awesome. And um, so, yeah, that's my idea as of right now. And last year, um, with a fellow student, James Burnell, um, we took on an independent study where our goal was to actually make an app for the Bronxville School in which students could log in and they would be able to display their classes for the day, the cafeteria menu for the day, and any additional, maybe if a teacher was absent or if there were assignments, it would all be displayed within the app. Cool. You're good. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Okay, so, you know, just, I mean, I don't need to say much more, but I will. <laughs> uh, you can see how, you know, this design thinking is taking shape here, and whatever they decide in terms of finding a problem, they'll have to work really hard to understand their user and then design something to help better their experience. Um, I also wanted to just take a few minutes to relate this to some new standards. Uh, next generation science standards have been adopted by New York State, but uh, the current plan is for districts to be building their capacity in terms of understanding them. Um, and that is exactly what we're doing right now as part of this work. Uh, but it's important to note that the NGSS actually calls out engineering design standards for every grade. And we've been looking at some curriculum to sort of think about exactly what this means. And, you know, for our youngest students in K-2, to um, this is about, you know, understanding that in science includes problems that people want to solve, not necessarily original solutions, um, but, you know, consider a need or a goal and design something. So you might see kids designing a catapult, uh, you know, from a simple machine. In grades three through five, they focus more on defining the problem and developing success criteria, including identifying constraints. Uh, one example is designing homes for three little pigs with sand, water, and glue to fight the effects of erosion and weathering to determine which design might be best. Um, in middle school, Students must engage in design thinking by testing and revising a number of times and potentially combining solutions to create new ones. Uh, one example is um, designing a new process for copper plating. And in high school, students are to look for global problems with social significance and are expected to use mathematical and or computer simulations to test under various conditions. And some examples might be designing solar water heaters or climate control uh, mechanisms. So you can see how these engineering design standards sort of grow from early students' experience up to um, high school where students are really defining their own problems with global sig significance and attempting to design something to help solve them. So without further ado, I'd like to call some students up who are in Justine Rutherford's uh, Bronx River Research to talk about um, a water quality probe that they plan to design. Hi, I'm Evelyn Klumper, and this is Ben Von Marin and Joe Seminara, and we are students enrolled in the Bronx River Research Elective, and um, this is actually my first year taking this class, and I heard a lot, I had heard a lot about the 
problems with the water quality of the Bronx River, and I did not really understand the extent of this until I started testing the water this year. <laughs> and so um, Enterococcus is a protein that is found in uh, the colon, and the level of Enterococcus Enterococcus in a body of water for it to be suitable for swimming is 30, and the level of the Bronx River is 4,000. <laughs> so it's really the standards of water quality of the Bronx River are really, really <laughs> appalling. And so, That's yeah, <laughs> as <laughs> yeah, as Dr. Ketke discussed. Um, the three of us and Jack Palermo, who was couldn't make it tonight, have had the wonderful opportunity to be able to design our own curriculum in which we have the opportunity to build and code and um, bring together the components of a probe in which we can te continuously test distilled, uh, sorry, um, dissolved oxygen, pH, and temperature of the water. And yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so some of the goals that we have for this probe, um, as you can see here, minimize time, work, and resources put into regular river trips. On average, I'd say that the Bronx River Independent Study probably went to the river once a week. The main point of this probe is so that we can put it in and just have it collecting ta data throughout months. So we can just have a constant stream. You know, changes in weather like snowstorms can affect pH level. Um, so we really just want to be able to see what is going on all the time instead of at one moment, at one point in a week. It's just really not enough data to make conclusions. Um, we will be building this probe using coding and engineering, and the fact that the four of us have actually been put into this group is pretty amazing because uh, Evelyn and Jack both have experience with coding from <coughs> last year's coding class that they took, and uh, Joe and I have experience with hardware. He's will be crucial when building the case for the probe, and I've actually uh, built a computer myself, so uh, I have experience with computer hardware, which is very important, obviously. Um, and, you know, with our teacher, Ms. McClellan, it's just been, she's done a great job helping us uh, from a biology standpoint. So this is the uh, outline for our probe right now. It's really just a rough draft. We haven't started to build anything right now. Uh, it's going to be out of PVC pipe, and it'll probably stand uh, four feet in the river. We project that we'll be able to build it over the next two months uh, using different types of technology and different methods that we've never used before. <laughs> uh, I've been a part of this for three years now, and we've never done anything like this, so this is a whole new process. <coughs> So it'll be a lot of PVC pipe, and we'll actually have it stay in the river for a while, and we hope it can stay for over months at a time. Uh, the sensors that you see coming out of the bottom are pH, dissolved oxygen, temperature, and those will actually give us data for over a whole amount of time, because we've only been able to get one data point a week. Uh, so to do this, we have to have a system that will actually have it stay there for a while because the water level actually rise three feet sometimes just in one night. And we can't let anything in that house get wet because <laughs> it's all computers. So we actually want it to stay four feet out and the probes are actually really long. So no matter where the water level goes, we'll be able to test it. And we're hoping that while we go with this, we can actually find new ways to improve it because it's been done before only once in Virginia. And other than that, no one else has ever tried it. So we're trying to see if we can actually make the whole thing waterproof so that when no matter what happens at the river, uh, say rain or just melting of snow can impact the water level so that it can actually stay waterproof through anything.
Do you have any questions that you're also hired? Do you have any questions for these students? Yes, how, and then with that information that you get, and when it works, uh, how do you foresee that this will help in potentially cleaning up the Bronx River or making it less bad? <laughs> so right now, right. this is just gonna help us see what happens to the river over like the night and day. Uh, we don't really know right now what is the problem with the river. Like we said, our end Hurricaucus levels are so high and we've been doing this for now four years and we don't know what it is. So with this, we're gonna try and build it so that future students who take this class will be able to also improve it and then find ways to think of what could actually be polluting the river. Right. Have you shared the data with any government agencies? You think that's <laughs> a, something you'll do? We have not, actually. Uh, Oh, well, the mayor comes, uh, she sees it, but other than that, <laughs> uh, other than that, we haven't really contacted anyone else, but we f we're trying to spread the word. I mean, this river goes all the way up from Valhalla down through the Bronx, so we really want to get Westchester involved, which we've been trying to do, but they're not, they don't really contact us back. <laughs> I, actually, I think Jim Palmer from the village was at the presentation when you guys did it. Um, um, when I when I was there, you guys were in the lobby of the auditorium doing a presentation, and he was in the audience, and he was very interested in in learning more about the river. I think he talked about you know there might be pipes from homes that were built many many years ago where their waste might go directly into the river. Wow. They don't really know, so he was interested in getting some of the data from you guys when you start collecting it as well. Okay, well, thank you, and thank you very much. Real problems All right. and lightning. <laughs> but as you can see from the kids, you know, we're engaging in some of this work right now, and I, I think without question, I just want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Ashley, Mr. Brad Ashley, and Justine McClellan, who are leading these students in these experiences um, with very good outcomes. Um, you know, innovation is not just for the students, uh, it is also for us. So as an administrative team, all the principals, myself, um, Dr. Montesano, Jen Forsberg, enrolled for in a course uh, given through the Tri-States Consortium entitled Bold Moves for Schools, How We Create Remarkable Learning Environments Taught by Heidi Hayes Jacobs. And this has really asked us to sort of be more innovative about the process of school and how we design it. And as a result of that, we've been thinking of a number of things. Um, one thing, as Jeff mentioned, is space. I mean, we are uh, pushing the capacity of the space as, we, as it's currently configured to its maximum capacity. And we really, uh, as you heard, want these students to be able to work collaboratively, um, spread out, go to places where they can actually build prototypes and test them. Um, and have the resources to do whatever they can imagine and create, uh, as well as have spaces where they can go to work appropriately and meet with classes as a whole group when necessary, but be also productive in, even in small groups as, and individuals. Um, thinking about our use of time. Um, do we have the right time structures in place to do all that we uh, want to do, in particular thinking about you know, some of the work we've done with TC. Do we have the appropriate time for our students to engage in reading and writing workshops, as well as have we configured time appropriately uh, when students are meeting other challenges that sort of ask of them to do things that are beyond what we have asked before. Uh, design thinking can also enlighten our processes for, from anything from uh, how how we ask kids to register for classes. You know, we can think about the pain points is the term they use in design thinking associated with that and maybe redesign our process accordingly. Um, and then a capstone course. You know, a lot of the things you've heard kids talk about are things that would be interesting for them to present to panels as evidence of the Bronxville promise. Uh, and you know, maybe even get some formative feedback and then come back 
uh, for one or two more rounds of that? And what would that look like if we turned that into a course where students could actually find their own problem uh, or work with a group to find a problem that aligns with, let's say, leadership and innovation and, and created something in order to address a need that they discovered. So all of these opportunities have been excellent for us as well as the educators who are in who uh, have these students in our care. It's been exciting um, and I hope we get to return to this in the spring to share some of the results. Questions for me? I can't answer any about X code or <laughs> whatever that was. Thanks Mara. Okay, oh, thank wait, you. wait, John. I have a, I have a question. Oh, okay. Um, I saw that the, the, the new course catalog for next year came out recently, maybe today, and, and there were some new <coughs> classes, which I think are great, physical computing, AP computer science. Are there, are there classes that you have in mind or subject areas that you have in mind that you are thinking about rolling out over the next couple of years that you haven't yet, that we haven't yet rolled out, that you're just sort of... Um, um, I think this caps capstone course is potentially one of them. Um, you know, could we pull something like this together in, you know, we now have kids doing this process in multiple classrooms and with multiple skills according to content area, but does it make sense to do, let's say, a survey course of the dispositions of the promise, immerse yourself in some of the literature associated with innovators, um, leaders, et cetera, and then choose a problem and solve it. Um, that's been one idea. Um, I think there are potentially some other ideas about adding more electives that are aligned to current disciplines where we have less electives. So we've been thinking about some of those things. Thanks. Hey, thank you very much, Mara. Thanks, Mara. It, uh, it, it has to uh, impress all of us considering uh, how we were educated sitting in the room with a teacher in the front of the room and how things are different. And it, and it feels so much like when people get their first job and they throw you out there and you're with a team and you're pretty much on your own uh, to collaborate and develop um, and uh, come to a conclusion. So I, I think that you can see how we are preparing people uh, for that, preparing our students for that now, for college and for their uh, you know, for their future. So it's changing so rapidly that uh, it's just uh, it's just fun to watch. You know. Let's yeah. And the other thing I want to uh, mention related back to the referendum, and when we talk about the space needs, and it's not about adding space; it's about re-engineering um, our space that we have. And so, the more we have children involved in the research and collaboration, building uh, items, you know, we we truly don't have a space to do the, that kind of work. So it's about redoing some of the, um, the spaces that we do have to accommodate the new type of learning that we want to promote, especially through the promise. So, you know, it's, it's one thing to say, you know, we have 25 students, we want to put them all in a classroom, but this kind of work doesn't happen in rows with desks and chairs. It requires different thinking and different um, formation of space. So that's, that's what's really driving uh, when we talk about innovative learning spaces this is the kind of work that we're envisioning. Okay, uh, can we move on to the, uh, to uh, Dr. Kelly who is unable to be with us tonight, so uh, Mr. Carlin's going to uh, pinch it for her. I'm gonna move to uh, Dr. Kelly's report. We have a number of reports. items okay. on the personnel agenda this evening. Uh, items A through A E uh, involve approving Family Medical Leave Act leaves and associated replacements. Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to uh, look at those. Um, do we have a motion to approve? So moved. We have a motion and a second. And a second. Are there any questions on any of A, a through E? Yes. Any questions? Um, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, thank you. That motion passes. I'll take the next grouping is uh, F through J. Uh, approving resignations and appointments of teacher aides, interns, and substitutes. Okay. Normal course of business. A motion? So moved. Now we have a motion and a second. Uh, any questions on any of these? Second. 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 Okay, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
Okay, thank you. That motion passes. K and L uh, involved changes in civil service staffing. Uh, we have a, a resignation of uh, Henry Kendrick, uh, who's been working here a, a long time. You know, we certainly appreciate all Henry has done for us. I understand he may be relocating. Um, and L is uh, an appointment of a database specialist to re uh, replace uh, someone who recently resigned. So we're excited to have uh, that in place as well. And then M through R, uh, our co-curricular and, and athletics related appointments, uh, revised coaching and co-curricular rosters, and then the spring coaches roster. And these are all in conformity with the uh, newly negotiated uh, curricular yes. contract. Okay. Move. Uh, we have a motion. Second. And a second. Uh, any questions on K through R? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. That passes. Thank you, Mr. Carlin. My pleasure. You still get to stay with me. All right. Well, there you go. Uh, the board has received a, uh, a current year budget summary prepared by me and uh, backing documents. Uh, that show us in a pretty good shape uh, as we enter. Uh, we're about 40% 40, 40 done with the school year if you look at it from September to June. Um, and I'm projecting a surplus in the 450 to, to $500,000 range at the moment. And a lot of that is driven by revenues this year. You know, if Rachel was here, I'd, uh, I'd uh, give her kudos because uh, our uh, special ed uh, tuition program is uh, very successful this year um, we're also exceeding revenue projections in uh, our uh, regular education tuition students and uh, sales tax collections so uh, and we're also going to get a little more state aid and, and you know the, all of that adds up with uh, I'm now seeing some expenditure savings and salaries and employee benefits I anticipate that as we get further through the year and more clarity presents itself, that that number will increase. So I think uh, we're, in, we're in very good shape in the current year. Okay. Uh, Jeff, I have to go. Merry Christmas, okay. everybody. Right. Thank you, Tom. And Merry Christmas to you as well. Oh, he's got his, uh, his entourage with him. There, huh? right, right. Got a posse. So some people just come to, to some it. people just come to see <laughs> Curran, you know, and then, <laughs> and, and it's uh, and it's completely understandable. I mean, that's why, why, uh, the entertainment. There's no more entertainment now tonight. Okay, uh, next is the um, uh, we'll we have financial action. Uh, before I get there, uh, I'll continue my underwhelming uh, presentation right. by. Uh, Letting everybody know that the New York State Comptroller's Office is now camped out. Uh, they're doing their uh, once every five years. Our turn is, is now. Uh, we expect them to be in for a couple of months. Um, uh, we think we do a good job, but if they uh, think there's anything we can do better, uh, you know, we certainly welcome it. Dan, are they looking at anything specific? Or is no. General? They come in, do a general audit. If they find anything they want to target, they'll go dig deeper on that. They'll start with a risk assessment, yeah. similar to what uh, our internal auditors might do. I, so, I'm meeting with them Thursday. Okay, yep. I met with them the other day. Then they will, they'll do a risk assessment, then they'll select, I don't know how many areas, a limited number of areas to go Changes deeper. from district to district. There's, right. there's no real hot items at the moment. Uh, we have had no significant uh, major uh, recommendations from either our auditors or our internal auditors, which we have every year. So, um, um, but we'll see uh, how this goes. Um, any other action item? Uh, well, uh, I'm going to talk about the budget development first. Uh, we're near. I've nearly completed the first budget draft, which will be out by the end of the week. This is for the 2000. Uh, I guess it's 1819 year. Mm -hmm. um, we still have a few open items, <laughs> uh, final teachers retirement system rates, um, state aid projections, and uh, the inflation figure for calculating the tax cap. I, I'm expecting the cap to be over 
two and a half percent since the municipal inflation number was very close to two percent and uh, uh, our assessment growth factor which we get from the state uh, which is a variable in the cap calculation was about 0.7 percent so I think that'll get us over two and a half percent as a cap and then the board over the next few months will decide exactly where they want to be but the retirement already is has a significant impact how much of how much does that pull off of that to that off the bat that's probably close to 250 to 300 thousand dollars which uh is Just probably close, about close uh, to one percent yeah, three close, quarters of a percent. Under one percent so um there we have man we do have the numbers for next for next year for retirement right for we they give us a range and right we budget at the top of the range so when the final numbers come in we'll reduce the budget so that would be the equivalent of if retirement were the same it would be exactly. say one one point seven five percent cap yep so um okay so that's one of one of the issues we're dealing with this year i do have a couple of financial action items please go ahead uh, the first being a donation from the Bronxville Youth Council, which is dissolving to offset costs incurred by the Youth Council, which we have taken over uh, in the Bronxville uh, School. Um, there should be another donation when it's officially dissolved after the new year. This is just an initial disbursement of $12,000. So this um, was a separate fund, funding yes. mechanism, and then these were contributions that had been received it was at, at some point was a, uh, was also a community fund entered or got contributions from the community fund. Yes. The school took it over, and now it's uh, dissolving, and it'll be the uh, school. So the whatever's left in essentially the fund balance will, will come, come to, to us school. to offset costs over the program. Okay. Uh, the uh, the Are second. Are there any is questions about? Is any? the nature of the program changing with the no. with the change of the? No. I'm sorry, what was the question? Why is it why being absorbed by the school? Why, and why, why did we have to take over the youth council or? Well, the community fund stepped up and said we, they didn't feel it was appropriate and they thought this was a school activity and that it wasn't the typical kind of health and welfare and organizations the community fund would fund, you know, with their, so it, so we have it. So it came back, or we could dissolve it or not have it. And so um, I think that was the other major source of uh, contributions. And so that was a community fund decision to bring it back into the school, and, and uh, I think that was appropriate. And the, the other item is a, a small foundation grant from the uh, Jackson Designated Fund for Performing Arts of $900 for uh, dance workshops for middle and high school musicals during the current school year. So I'd ask the board to accept both of those donations. Okay, do we have a motion? Motion. Do we have a motion? Second. Do we have a motion and a second. Any other questions? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carlin. Moving on to facilities, um, the bid is out for the, uh, the library uh, project and due back before our next meeting in January. Um, uh, there is news that the schedule has been revised. Uh, we thought we were going to have to close the library at the February break. We've moved that now to the April break, so that's good news. Um, and uh, it's my understanding that uh, that will not impact the end date of the project. So we're happy with that. So you still think it's going to be uh, completed before the new school mm -hmm. next year? That's the goal. You, ne you know, again, it's a 100-year-old building, and, and the library hasn't really been touched in a long time, so you... We never know what we're going to find behind some walls when we start take, taking them down. So why are we pushing back the start time? It's it because they can't really do much. We're, we don't. They can't work during the school day um, because of the uh, uh, impact it would have on the classroom surrounding. So to have them work those five days isn't really much of a gain 
for to have it sit idle. Five weeks, you mean? Or five oh, yeah. It sounded it sound like what you said. It was going to be five weeks. Uh, what I'm saying is February. the five days that they gain by working in the February break. Oh, got it. So when are they going to start working full time? Uh, full time when school's out, but they'll uh, they may work a second shift beginning in April. I thought they were they can't do a weeks. yeah they can't do a lot of intrusive work over that period. They can do you know they can come in on April break and do as much demo as they can, and then do some some low key work perhaps during the school we day. Just heard you, so yeah. Thank you. And then. Um, uh, we heard about the capital plan earlier in the meeting. Um, and then uh, the last item is a facilities action item. We heard back from uh, the historic preservation uh, regarding our uh, planned uh, capital project coming forward that there's no adverse impact uh, from the perspective of historic preservation and there's action items uh, related to the environmental quality review uh, there's a required resolution to close the review process and declaring that there's no adverse impact, which uh, is, is the case. So nothing for us to approve there? Just a re the, the uh, envi oh, environmental okay. quality review resolution. Okay, the resolution. Okay. It's, uh, That's the resolution there. Rather right. long. <laughs> right. And I think there's an authorization for Connie to, to fill out an affidavit or something. Yes. Pass the resolution. Like a notarization of the fact that we're doing right. resolution. Okay. Okay, so I have a motion to approve. So move. And a second. Second. Any questions? Whatever. <laughs> okay. all, all in favor? No, 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 no. Give it to our. <laughs> yeah. Fight you for it. This side, we're winning on. on the <laughs> That's right, right, right. And we're down people. Yeah. All, right. um, all in favor? Aye. All right, thank you. Any opposed? Okay, that passes. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item is also mine as well, uh, policy review, uh, second reading on the investment policy and the, uh, the reason we're, we're updating it is to uh, include recommended language which has been approved by council uh, to help generate yield via cooperative investment uh, opportunities, uh, dealing primarily in uh, treasury bills, notes, and uh, the highest quality commercial paper. But we'd be really targeting uh, treasury instruments um, of a, uh, probably liquid within a week, because um, we we get two huge tax payments during the year, so we can uh, we can tie up some money for a week. Right now we're in in uh, bank money markets. We're getting about seventy basis points, anywhere from forty to seventy basis points. Uh, checking with interest is less, it's less than 10 basis points, and we feel we can get uh, 110 or 120. So it's, a, it's an opportunity to easily double our interest income without uh, any, any additional risk. Sounds like a good plan. So this is our second reading of this. This has been approved uh, by the, the Finance or Audit Committee? Or? Uh, or both? Finance committee. Finance reasons. committee looked this at it. Yeah. Council has looked at it. Okay, great. So, um, and we're required to look at it as a board every year. Right. So, um, do we have a motion to approve? Move. So we have a motion, and is there a second? And we have a motion and a second. Uh, any questions? Final questions on this policy. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Right. Thank you, Mr. Carlin. That passes. And uh, our next item is says here merger of the girls volleyball. Is that Karen, or who is handling that one? Yes. Um, so we've been uh, we've had quite a bit of interest in girls volleyball in the middle school and uh, some in the high school for a number of years. We do not have the ability to have a competitive court in either one of our gyms right now. Um, so we've for two years. Start those 
discussions with your approval to see if we can't place a couple of our girls on their varsity team. I don't think we'll do JV and modified at first, um, but we'd like to um, allow these young ladies a place to play competitively. That's great. Okay. Uh, any questions? Do we uh, is that an approval, County, for us? Or is it? Yes. Oh. Okay. Uh, this resolution. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion. Do I have a motion. Second. second. And second. Uh, questions. So is this an annual John. thing we'd have to redo every year? Yeah. yeah. We're hard to keep up with, County. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we have so many people that are, you know, jumping forth. And uh, so, um, age group tonight. So this would be an annual approval until we get our own volleyball team. Huh? Okay. All in, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Okay. That concludes the uh, formal part of the meeting, and then we'll open the meeting up to public. And remind everyone this is uh, uh, particularly uh, directed towards agenda topics, but not personnel matters uh, with respect to, or matters with respect to individual personnel or, or students. So, is there anyone in the public who would like to comment for the meeting? Okay, with that, do I have a motion to? So move. Adjourn. We have a motion. <laughs> second. A motion and a second. All in favor. Hey. Meeting is adjourned. Okay. Great. Merry Christmas, guys.